The reading this morning is from the book of Luke, chapter 24, verses 36 to 49. That can be found on page 1062 of the Bible. 1062. That's 36 to 49. Jesus appears to the disciples. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I, myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. This is the word of the Lord. Resurrection. We're resurrection people. What does the resurrection mean? What does it mean? Why, why should we bow down and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord? What does it look like? And why? Why do we sing that? Do we really bow down and confess he is Lord? What does that look like to bow down and confess that he is Lord. Well, we bow down and confess that he is Lord because of the resurrection, because it's not pie in the sky when we die. It's meat on the plate as we wait. We are called to be resurrection people, living in the light and the power of the resurrection. And I want to look at five resurrection appearances this morning. If you've, got your, if you've got a Bible, you can look them up. And as we look at those resurrection appearances, they're intensely personal. They're personal stories. You can feel your way into them. But they also tell us something of what the resurrection means and how to apply it in our own lives. So let's pray. Father God, I pray that you would open our eyes and our minds and our hearts to really, really understand what the resurrection means. Because to be honest, Lord, we, we've got a very paltry understanding. And help us as you open our minds and our hearts and our eyes to then live in the power of the resurrection. We ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen. So five instances of the resurrection appearances. The first one comes in Luke 24, verses 13 to 35, and it's the road 
to Emmaus. You may remember this passage, you may not. There are two people are walking back to Emmaus, two disciples of Jesus, followers of Jesus, not the one of the 12 disciples, but followers. They're walking back to Emmaus because everything had gone wrong. Jesus was dead. And they don't understand what has gone on. It says in the passage, we had thought that this was going to be, this was going to be the thing. This was going to be the thing. And that Jesus was going to be the Messiah and he was going to overthrow the Romans. But that's obviously not true. And then they say, and you know what? And they're thinking to each other sometimes. And people are saying that he's come back to life again. And we don't know what to think. What is this? And you know when you get, um, you know, you, you hear something about someone. And people are telling you all sorts of things from different, different areas. Well, I know this and this and this. It, it, it can, yeah, it can be gossip. But you wonder where the truth is. And then when the person that it's actually about stands in front of you, you suddenly get the whole truth. And Jesus comes alongside these two disciples, Cleopas and his friend, and he, he starts to talk to them. And he shows them that Jesus had to rise, die and that, that it, he, was, he always was going to rise from the death. And it says, beginning with the prophets, he showed them. He went through the whole of the narrative. The whole of the story of creation, to, to God's choosing of a nation, to God's to, to, to exile, to sending the prophets, to the sacrifice system, to the coming of Jesus, to his teaching, to his death, and now the resurrection. And he says, he says, this is the story. Understand it. And suddenly understanding comes to these two disciples. And then as he breaks the bread... Suddenly their eyes are opened. They understand in their heads first of all. And then they see and understand that Jesus is there in front of them. He has risen. It is true. Suddenly it all makes sense. I understand now. I understand God's redemption of humankind. I understand. Second story is from John 20, 24 to 29. And Jesus had appeared to the disciples, and Thomas had said, they told Thomas, and he said, I don't believe you unless I put my hands in his side and his hands and see the nail marks, I won't believe. And suddenly Jesus stands among them. Thomas needed evidence. He needed evidence that Jesus really had risen from the dead. And he wasn't going to believe until there was evidence. And Jesus turned to him and said, Thomas, you believe because you've seen. Blessed are those who do not see and yet believe. You are people who have not seen the resurrected Jesus. You are not one of those witnesses, but you believe. You believe because of the evidence of Jesus, of God in your life. It's why we tell testimony of God's goodness, of God's working through tragedy, through suffering, of God's of God's goodness in our lives. And Peter writes, and later on in, 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 the, in the scriptures, he writes in 1 Peter, be, you haven't seen, but be thankful that the salva salvation is happening in your souls. We believe because, the, because of, we may not see, but we have hope. And that's the definition of faith, isn't it? Faith is, is, is having believing in the things you do not yet see. 
Thomas needed evidence. The third story is this, from John 20, verses 1 to 18, Mary, Mary Magdalene. She was the last person at the cross, and she was the first at the tomb, and she was the first to recognize and see Jesus risen. Mary, perhaps the one who had seven demons cast out of her. The one who was so close to Jesus because he had transformed her life around. She was the one who had been forgiven much. And so she loved much. Mary needed comfort. And suddenly she sees Jesus. Thinking him to be the gardener. But then she says, Rabboni. And Jesus says, do not hold on to me. Go and tell my disciples that I have risen. Jesus is there in the darkest places. Romans 8. Paul writes, If God has done all this for us, won't he also do it, give us all things? He writes, what can separate us from the love of God? Can trouble, can hardship, can famine, can nakedness, can sword? No, because of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. And maybe he, as a good Pharisee, was thinking back to the Psalms that he would know. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. Even in the valley of the shadow of death, he is with me. Jesus brings comfort to Mary. Death could not hold him. Even in the darkest place, the resurrection brings comfort. The next picture is this. John chapter 21. Peter. Remember, Peter was the one who had denied Jesus three times. And before he de denied him, he said, Master, I'll never leave you. I'll die for you. And a few hours later, he denied him three times before the cock crowed twice. It was the last time he had seen Jesus. Then Jesus was put on a cross. Then he, then he died. And here they are, John chapter 21, you can read it, out fishing and uh, then there's a figure on the shoreline, and the figure says, have you caught anything? They say, no. He says, well, throw your nets on the other side. They do so. Miraculous catch of fish, more than they could ever think or imagine. Peter realizes it's the Lord, and so he gets out of the boat, and he jumps out, and he runs to him. And there is a charcoal fire, and they have fish and bread. But you know, I think it was a bit awkward. There was an elephant in the room. You know, when there's an elephant in the room, when you think there's something here we really need to address, um, but I really don't want to. It's standing over there, that elephant, and it's very big, but we pretend it doesn't exist. Because Peter knew that he had denied Jesus. And perhaps Peter remembered that he'd asked Jesus... How many times should I forgive my brother? Seven? Thinking that, that, was the, that was, that's the perfect number, that was as much as you could do. And Jesus says, no, 70 times seven, and then tells the parable of the unmerciful servant. I wonder whether Peter is thinking about that parable. Is Jesus going to forgive me for what I've done? But he's talked about forgiveness is 70 times 7. Does it cover this one? Does it cover my brashness? Does it cover my desertion? Does it cover my denial? And Jesus takes him aside. He doesn't do it publicly. And you can read it in John 21. And he basically restores Peter, he does more than he forgive him. He restores him to the place where he was before. He said, you are Peter, and on, this, on you, I will build my church. 
You imagine Peter thinking, how can he build his church on me? But Jesus restores him. He needed restoration. The resurrection brought restoration. Peter needed it. The resurrection brought it. And the final passage is this from Luke 24, 36 to 49. And it's one Alistair read to us. The disciples. The disciples needed hope. Despair. Jesus gone. They needed hope for something. What now? And Jesus comes in the midst of them. And they were thinking, well, what hope is there? We thought he was going to overthrow the Romans. And now he's dead, so he can't do that. And Jesus comes and he gives them so much more. He says, no, it's not about the Romans. I am giving you the task to, to, to influence the whole world. I am giving you the task to go and teach and, and talk about me and, and repentance of sins and forgiveness. That's your task. But do not be hopeless. There is hope. And then, of course, we read in Luke's gospel, in, in the Acts of the Gospel. Anybody here a good Anglican? Anybody reading the lectionary at the moment? Oh dear, oh dear. <laughs> well, I am. The lectionary at the moment, we're going through Acts. The lectionary is what the Anglican Church decide what we ought to read. It's going through Acts. And just this week, we've been going through, well, just yesterday it was Acts chapter 4, when Peter goes into the temple, and there's the beggar, and the, he's a layman, and he gives out, well, I don't have anything, any arms, what I give, I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ, get up and walk. And he gets up and goes leaping and praising God. And even they, they, have, they have Peter and John up against in the, in the, the, Pharisees, the religious people, and they say, what are you doing? And Peter gives it to them. He says, well, Jesus, who you hung on a tree, is, is alive. The blood is on your shoes. Jesus is alive. And they say, well, what are we going to do with him? I know, we'll just tell them to be quiet. And then Peter says, we cannot keep quiet. Because the Holy Spirit has come, Jesus is alive, he sent his spirit, and we want to tell the world of the hope that there is in Jesus Christ. Why? Because he is not a dead religious leader. He is the God of all, who has defeated the final enemy, which is death. It shows his power. He is the ultimate. We cannot stop speaking about him. So five instances. And the question I want to ask each of us is what does the resurrection mean to you? Now hopefully it means all those things. You can understand the narrative, the, the rescue mission of God. Without the resurrection, it does not make sense because we, have a, we will have a dead founder. But with the resurrection, it makes perfect sense. That's why Paul writes, you know, we, we, without the resurrection, we are nothing. Christianity doesn't make sense. But Christ is raised from the dead, the first fruits of all for those who sleep. There is understanding. Christianity makes sense only with the resurrection. The resurrection is the evidence of God's sovereignty and power. Death, where is thy sting? Death has been overcome. The resurrection says God is sovereign. God is Lord. The resurrection means that nothing, 
there is nothing that cannot be forgiven and restored in your life. Nothing. We are new creations. Just as the body of Jesus was resurrected again, so when we come to him, we are new creations. You can be forgiven. You are forgiven. You are restored. You are a child of God seated in heavenly places with him. Why? Because he is seated in heavenly places because he was, is rose again and ascended into heaven. And so you are seated at heavenly places in a spiritual realm. So there is nothing that can separate you from the love of God. Trouble, hardship, nothing. In the resurrection, there is hope. There is hope even in the suffering. Because our hope is not based on our circumstances. Our hope is not based on our riches. Our hope is not based on our education and exams. Our hope is not based on our marriage or our kids. That's not where our hope is based. Our hope is based on Jesus Christ who rose again from the dead. Romans 5 verse 5. Hope does not, in your suffering, suffering produces perseverance and perseverance hope. And hope does not disappoint. Why? Because God has poured out his love for us in his heart. Because it's all about him. Because of the narrative. God has poured out his love into our hearts. And so our hope is not on these things around us. It is on the God who is sovereign. And so when we are going through the sufferings, blessed be your name in the sufferings. Great songs we've been singing. They've been all about this sermon. That actually it's all about God. When I call on your name, you answer. You're there. Blessed be your name in the suffering. Why? Because you are God. Because you have been raised from the dead, Jesus. It goes beyond the things to the person of Jesus. Our hope is in Jesus Christ, risen from the dead. It is beyond the things to the person of Jesus. So, what do we do? Well, we sung about it. We bow down and confess that you are Lord. We sung about it in one of the other songs where it said, we surrender. I stop looking at the things that will disappoint me. Some will be good, some won't. I look to you, Jesus. Because you are the Lord of all, because you have risen from the dead, and so I have hope, so I have understanding, so I have evidence, so I have comfort, so I have restoration, and I have so much more too. So what do you want the to be to you today? That's the question. What is the resurrection to you today? What response do you need to make to Jesus who has risen from the dead? Let's be confident. Following a dead leader, but a risen Lord who calls us to surrender to him. And in surrendering, we partner with him on this great thing called our lives. Let's do it with him. Because he brings us understanding, evidence, hope, comfort, and restoration. What can separate us from the love of God? Can trouble, hardship, famine, nakedness, sword, no. All these things we are more than conquerors. In other words, we're conquering these things that are around us. That's what it means. We are conquering it. So whatever is around her, we are more than conquerors because of Jesus. 
but let's be conquerors. Because that is victory is what God has called us to. Let's stand, shall we? I'm just going to pray. Father God, we want to say we have confidence, not in ourselves, but in you this morning. Because Jesus, you are raised from the dead. And you have seated us at the heavenly places. We take our place at the heavenly places today. We exalt you as Lord of our lives. And we choose to go out into this world living a life that is surrendered, partnered with you, Jesus. So that we can be different. So that all the things around us are put in their true perspective. Thank you that Christ has been raised from the dead. And resurrected life is mine to live today. Amen.